Welcome to Leading in the New Reality Live, a series about topics we are discussing with business leaders and governments around the world. I'm here today with my two colleagues, Carol Liao and Sharon Marcel. Hi, thanks for being here with me today. Hi, my brave. Thanks care. for having me. So today we will be discussing a very important and interesting topic that is on most leaders' minds, which is around how to restart the economy. From the discussions I'm having here in Europe with leaders, the number one priority is how to safely bring people back to work. Who to bring back, when to bring them back, and how to do it. It's a major operation that needs to happen in, uh, in companies around the world. Secondly, it's not only about bringing people safely back, it's also how to keep people safe. So how do we resume and ramp up operations whilst keeping our employees and society protected from infection risk? In fact, we are discussing how to use big data and build apps to bring people safely back to work to be able to do contract, tra contract tracing and so we avoid having to close down a major manufacturing plant or a major uh, headquarter by, by being able to quarantine selected units in case of infection risk. Of course, a lot of questions around data protection and privacy concerns are involved, and so lots of interesting discussions. Carol, you're in China, and China is weeks ahead of us in terms of restarting the economy. What can you share from China? What has worked and what's on leaders' minds at the moment? Sure, my great. Um, you know, we are indeed a little bit uh, ahead. And as you can see, right, I'm talking to you from uh, my office, not from home. And we've been uh, back to work for uh, a couple of months now. Uh, in Shanghai, even the Disneyland opened uh, this week. Uh, so it's a quite a you know, big milestone on the reopening. Uh, I think there are a few things. Uh, number one, of course, opening is managed in phases. I think every country is doing that or plan to do uh, in this way. Um, but secondly, right, uh, what happened in China is um, it does help uh, have a consistent set of uh, central uh, guidelines. Of course, a lot of the decisions left to a uh, local level for adaptation and implementation. You know, for instance, uh, for school opening, uh, the central government has a guideline for the graduating grade, the senior grade in the high school and in middle school. That's linked to the national entrance examination date uh, for college and, and high school. But all the rest of the students are very much left to a uh, province, city, or even school level to, uh, to decide. Uh, but it helps to have some consistent central guidelines on you know, what's the condition to reopen, right? What's the disease condition? What's the healthcare capacity? Uh, and also what's the business readiness? And lastly, as you mentioned, very importantly, to sustain the reopening, digital tools need to be used to really uh, separate, identify the new cases separate from the uh, general public. Uh, there's a lot of uh, digital methodology being used. You know, one thing that's quite interesting is called the National Health Code. Uh, everybody has a code. It could be a uh, you know green, red, or yellow. Uh, that's uh, associated with your travel history and the risk level. Uh, and it used to be only uh, can be done at the city level, but now it can be done at the national level. It's really facilitated the domestic traveling a great deal to help the reopening. Hmm. Very interesting. I think China, also looking back, has always been very advanced when it comes to digital data. And I can imagine that in this situation, this is a, it's a key benefit for how you safely uh, reopen and resume operations across governments and businesses, schools, etc. Thanks for sharing, Carol. That's, that's really interesting. Sharon, you are in the US. What are the yeah. conversations you are having with leaders? Well, my Britt, first of all, thanks for um, having me here today. It's great to be here with you and Carol and, and hearing your perspectives because I so deeply admire both of you um, as partners at BCG. But look, here in the US, it's interesting because some things in common with what Carol said. So Carol said there are federal guidelines and, and health is a big priority. And also my Britt, you talked about safely bringing people back. And so that's all part of the dialogue here in the US. We have federal guidelines um, that's 
go across states. And then we also have health guidelines called the CDC guidelines. But where we are is each state, we have 50 states, each state is making its own decision about how and when to open up based on those guidelines. And within those 50 states, um, we're seeing differences of behavior, which is a function of the starting points of some of these states in terms of the, the severity of the disease, um, but then also some other factors at play as well um, in terms of the economic situation on the ground, for example. I will say an important influencer um, on this is the fact that the United States has the highest unemployment rate that it's had since the Great Depression. And, uh, and so now leaders, business leaders and government leaders are trying to walk that fine balance of bringing people back safely and getting the economy going again. Um, some states like Georgia have opened up pretty quickly. You see things like salons and retail establishments um, coming on board. Other states like the District of Columbia where I live um, have really only opened up outdoor, outdoor activity. So there are differences. And I think one of the key challenges is for a company that operates across the country, has different offices in different states and employees and customers in different states, it's a bit tricky in terms about thinking about bringing people back to work and doing that in a fair and safe way, but then also distribution of services. And I think that is to the good. You know, we're opening based on the situation on the ground and the people closest to the situation on the ground, um, you know, to potentially the bad, um, there it's a, a bit more complex in terms of how we're doing it. But I think over the next couple of weeks, we're going to learn a lot and, uh, and we'll be in a position where we can adjust going forward. Thanks for, um, for sharing, Sharon. It, it certainly with the details you're sharing uh, proves the point that this is a major operational task for companies, both US-based companies covering the US, but also certainly global companies as different countries and markets are at very different stages at the moment when it comes to the, um, uh, the, the spread of the coronavirus and the containment. So now I wanna change a little bit topic, but still a very important leadership topic, which is around demand and supply planning. What I discovered and some of the discussions I, I'm having with business leaders is around how to predict demand and how to adjust supply according to the new demand. Um, right now, many companies are experiencing that the, the demand models they usually relied on to plan their operations no longer works because consumers and customers have changed how they buy. They've changed their preferences and a lot of People have, of course, limited um, their spend in, in certain categories. And now that warrants for new modeling, both basic, based on external data with the uh, virus data, but also internal data. Carol, in China, are you experiencing the same? So new modeling for supply and demand planning and how are companies working with that topic? Right, well, you know, I think that's certainly uh, quite tricky, right? Uh, how to achieve the new balance. But here, what's on business leaders' mind, to be honest, the supply side of things is not too much of a concern. Uh, and things pretty much back to uh, normal, you know, the energy assumption, the manufacturing, the transportation, the logistics, um, you know, even the construction, you know, et cetera, right? Uh, what people are really quite concerned is how to accelerate the back to normal under the new normal. So it's very much on the consumption, on the demand side of things. Uh, you know, we do, we track high frequency data, you know, BCG, we do a consumer sentiment survey, you know, every uh, uh, two weeks, so we do see a positive trajectory, uh, but the things are not yet fully back to normal. You know, just last week, we had a five day uh, Labor Day, uh, May holiday uh, weekend, uh, compared to a long weekend only three weeks ago, you know, things improved significantly. But still, versus the same time last year, uh, you know, we still see uh, traffic is still at uh, about 60% level. Uh, and the revenue, right, the dollar amount is more, still less than half. So there's still a lot to do to restore the consumer confidence as well as accelerate, right, the consumption. You know, of course, the Disneyland reopening is very symbolic. And hopefully uh, that will help going forward. I certainly hope so. I think it's very comforting, though, uh, to learn that the supply side is back 
to normal, despite uh, the difficult January and February. However, I fully agree with you, the consumer confidence is the big question now, especially looking into a global recession. Sharon, from a US perspective, is this also what you're discussing, demand and supply planning, and what is the outlook there? Yes, yes. It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a great question. The supply question, I agree with Carol, it's gonna come back faster. Um, there are some supply chains which have been hard hit. For example, um, the meat supply chain, um, in terms of meat processors, that, that industry was hard hit by the virus. Um, so has, has been a bit slowed. There are other supply chain parts that are being reconsidered um, for national security purposes, you know, which is have we outsourced, you know, too much to too far places, you know, which actually, or too concentrated, which could actually be a problem in terms of our supply chain. But I agree with Carol, the supply will come back um, and is already coming back. On the demand side, you know, Carol referenced the consumer uh, sentiment survey, and you know, 85% of U.S. consumers have said that they um, changed their behavior due to COVID. Not surprisingly, 50% um, say when the lockdown is lifted, they want they want to get back to normal behavior, which is good. Um, and what you see, moreover, is that actually those differences, um, probably not surprisingly, are um, different. By, by demographics. So younger people actually very willing and, and energetic to get back, back to school, back to work, back to their normal life and activities. Older people are compromised people, you know, feeling a, a, a bit more cautious about it. Um, but all of that means the demand will come back. I think like in China, it will come back um, at a slow pace. And so there's a ways to go in terms of coming, coming out of this recession. Yeah. That's comforting. Thanks a lot for, uh, for sharing, Sharon. Even though the, the outlook is, is, of course, filled with uh, a lot of uncertainty at the moment when it comes to the demand side. It's been really interesting to talk to you today to, to hear about the, uh, the similarities, but also the differences across the world. And also, certainly, it's a complex issue to restart the economy. But it seems like we are on the right track. So far, so good. I want to thank you, Sharon and Carol, for being here with me today. It's been great. And next week, we will be back again. And the topic that we'll be discussing next week is around consumer behavior. We will be discussing how have consumers changed their purchase patterns and behaviors around the world. And what of these behaviors do we think will stick after the COVID-19 crisis and what will go back to normal. So I'm really looking forward to that. Also, thank you to our listeners today. We hope that we will see you again next week. Thanks, Sharon. Thank Thanks, Carol. Thank you. See you next thank week. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Carol. Take care.